have a, an excellent fish person here to talk with us, uh, Dr. Dennis Shiazawa. Just a little bit about him. He got his bachelor's degree at Weaver, his master's degree at BYU, and his PhD at the University of Minnesota. And Dennis is <clears throat> one of the, one of just a very few experts on the uh, cutthroat trout, and he's also worked with the endangered uh, fish in the Green and Colorado River system. But <clears throat> we're glad to have you here with us today to talk about the cutthroat trout, so Dr. Shears, I will turn it over to you. my title. I don't need to tell you again, so probably ought to get started. I've got quite a bit of stuff here, and I was so tired when I put it all together that I couldn't really time myself. <laughs> so I hope we're going to be okay. Um, first off, I do need to acknowledge that a lot of people have been involved in this work, uh, and these are just uh, people that have been working in the lab, a couple of postdocs, um, and then a number of graduate students, uh, tons of undergraduate students have worked in on the, these parts of these projects, and I didn't have time to go through and pull all the names up. And we work with quite a few different agencies. Um, uh, basically, I look at Western fishes, Western North American fishes, and uh, uh, I'm playing with genetics and, and try to overlay that with the geological history of the regions. So uh, we work with BLM, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Idaho, Nevada, Park Service, uh, very heavily with uh, UDWR, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, in Wyoming. So, just to make sure that uh, as, as I talk about this work, I'm just kind of seeing that they say, go do this and that, <coughs> call somebody to get this and that, and other people generate the data, then I tell you that, like I did, all the work. So, um, <coughs> well, <coughs> to give an introduction to the cutthroat trout, uh, between uh, the late 1700s and the 20th century, actually that should have been the late, I guess it would have been the late 1700s, uh, might have been a little bit earlier than that, but uh, there was quite a bit of collection of fish in uh, western North America, and about 50 different species of trout, and trout by trout I'm going to talk about, not uh, chars, but, but trout themselves, this would be uh, rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, uh, those types. And there are about 50 species that were described uh, between then and the early part of the 20th century. Uh, later, as people began to sit down and look at these fish a little bit more closely, they revised these, these 50 species and put them into about four species. If you want to keep the golden trout separate, then you'd have five species. But we basically have uh, the rainbow trout, uh, the Apache, the Gila, these are down in Arizona, New Mexico, and the cutthroat trout. Now the cutthroat trout is uh, kind of an interesting fish, in, in part it's noted because of this reddish slash down here uh, under the jaw. It's not the red up in here that's the cutthroat marking, it's this marking down here. And basically what they did is if they had this cutthroat mark, then they became a cutthroat trout. <coughs> they have the widest distribution of the uh, uh, of these uh, trout that were, were among the 50 that were identified. Uh, they range from Alaska down into California and inland over into Montana and south down into uh, New Mexico. And so we have a fairly large range that these fish cover. And again, these are all com compiled into a single species. Now as we talk about things, I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of the stream systems uh, because I'll be referring to some of these on and off and so if you haven't uh, paid much attention to geography for a long time then I'll just, just kind of be a refresher. Um, we have the Columbia River. I don't have the Columbia River drawn in here all the way. It, it actually starts here, goes up, goes up through the mountains up here, up into Canada. But 
the Columbia River is here. This is the Snake River right here, uh, mostly through Idaho, a bit up here in the Oregon-Washington border. Uh, when we talk about the Snake River, we'll talk about the Lower Snake River, which is this region in here, the Middle Snake, which is this region right in here, and the Upper Snake, which is this region up in here. And the Upper Snake is separated from the Middle Snake by uh, Shoshone Falls, uh, Twin, Twin Falls, Idaho, if you're familiar with that area. Um, below that, uh, the middle snake, at least in my mind, goes until roughly we reach Hell's Canyon on the Snake River up in this area. And then we move into the lower snake. Um, we have the Sacramento Pitt River system right here, the Humboldt River in Nevada, uh, the Bear River in Utah, which flows north and then flips at Soda Springs, flips south and comes into the Great Salt Lake. <coughs> the Green River, the Colorado River, and then a few others that become important for the cutthroat would be the Rio Grande, uh, the Arkansas, the South Platte. There's no trout, in, no native trout in this part here in the North Platte. And then we have the Missouri River system in here, and so there, there are cutthroat trout up in here as well. <coughs> so cutthroat trout have not only been fairly well established in, in the interior west. They've also got they've gotten over here into the some of these eastern drainages. And so when we look at this map, then we're looking at a, a group of fish that not only are coastal, but they've also invaded over the tops of the continental divide in a number of places. And um, they've also gotten into a number of these interior basins in the Great Basin region. <coughs> Most people because cutthroat are classified as cutthroat, look at a cutthroat as being just one type of, of a number of different trout that you catch. So if you grew up fishing the way I did, uh, we'd go out and we'd catch, in a given stream, we'd catch rainbow and brook trout, cutthroat and, and uh, brown trout, and we'd always get really excited when we got a cutthroat because it had a cutthroat slash on it. We'd talk about, hey, this is really a neat fish, it's got this slash. But as far as we're concerned, a cutthroat was as far as we would identify the fish, and that was good enough for, for what we were doing, which was catching fish to eat. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> um, in the late 1950s, Bob Benke, he just passed away last year, uh, began to re-examine these trout. And he worked on the cutthroat trout, and one of the big concerns was at that time, all cutthroat trout were equal, and so if we wanted to have cutthroat trout here in Utah, you would simply contact somebody uh, up in Yellowstone National Park and say we want to get half a million eggs, uh, ship them down here, we'll hatch them out, we're going to stock them all over the place in the Uinta Mountains because we want to have cutthroat back in there because that's what used to be here. And then he began to look at these things and looked at the geographical distribution and he began to separate them back out into subspecies. So instead of them being the same, he started talking about regional differences in these fish. And <clears throat> the ones along the coast, he called the coastal cutthroat. Uh, the ones over in here, um, mainly because of their presence on the west slope of the continental divide, became called the west slope cutthroat. The Yellowstone cutthroat trout were found around Yellowstone, obviously, but also along the Yellowstone River uh, in this area and also in the Snake River system. In the Lahontan Basin in Nevada was the Lahontan cutthroat trout. It's also spilled over a bit into some of the closed basins north of the Lahontan Basin. The fish in the Bonneville Basin were the Bonneville cutthroat trout. And in the Colorado River Basin were the Colorado River cutthroat trout. And they apparently had spilled over down into the Rio Grande, uh, forming the Rio Grande cutthroat trout, and over in here forming what were called the Greenback cutthroat trout. And so he began to talk about the uniqueness of these species. Uh, there are eight major subspecies that, that he named, and somewhere between 12 and 15 subspecies total. Some of those are now extinct. Um, some of them are questionable. Some of them I think should exist. Benke did not agree with me at all. He didn't think they should exist as subspecies. And then I argue with him over those kinds of things at meetings. And uh, but Benke being the boss always won. Um, <laughs> and uh, he felt they'd be able to differentiate about two million years ago. They're a Pleistocene uh, relic. They got in here in the Pleistocene and, and, and spread throughout the basins. 
This is just to give you an idea of some of the variability in these, these groups. Um, so here's a coastal, fairly fine spots on it. Actually, if you looked at it, uh, just catching one and, and holding one like this, you might think it's a rainbow from the way the spotting pattern appears. But as you go into some of these others, the greenback, you have fairly large spots. Um, here with the uh, west slope, some of the smaller spots, concentration with a lot of these towards the rear of the fish. In the Bonneville, the spots tend to be a little bit more evenly distributed. In the Lahontan, uh, the more, this shows them more evenly distributed. Now, one thing that I want to mention, when they drew these pictures, these were done with, with what Venti felt were the ideal fish representing the subspecies. So I've been out in Nevada collecting Lahontan cutthroat trout, and the Lahontans I was collecting looked like Bonnevilles in the spotting patterns, and some of them had spots all over the body. Some of them would have spots just right around the tail, and they'd be in the same population. So there's a tremendous amount of variability that we see with these fish within a population. And so when we look at this, you can't really look at those traits and be sure that you can actually tell what subspecies you're working with. If you know the geographical location, it's a little better, but because of all the stocking, that messes things up as well. <clears throat> So this is going back to give you, again, show you where the different subspecies are, are located. Now, Benke generated a hypothesis about what was going on here. Um, the cutthroat trout came from this invasion through the Columbia River, <coughs> and that started about two million years ago. And um, so <coughs> the invasion would have begun here in the Columbia system. They were coming upstream uh, to get into the interior. Then, in the early to mid Pleistocene, there was a separation. For the coastals were the ones that remained, down, remained down near the coast. The West Coast <coughs> and the ancestral Yellowstone began to split apart. So what happens is, is these fish here, that are farther up on the Columbia system, move on up into this region, those become the West Slope. The others are moving up the Snake River in this direction. Those are going to become the ancestral line for the Yellowstone. <clears throat> the next thing that happens is that in the mid Pleistocene, so sometime after that happens, uh, the Mahontan cutthroat uh, trout split off of the Yellowstone line. So these invade this way. And this, if you look at the distribution, this makes a lot of sense. It just seems, oh, this is really logical. This is what they ought to be doing. <clears throat> and then, from the Yellowstone line, we have this Colorado River cutthroat coming off. And so basically, from this line, this up in here, some of them stay as the Yellowstone. Some come over in the Colorado Basin, and that forms our Colorado River cutthroat trout. Now, in this scenario, the Bonneville Basin is fishless. Uh, the cutthroat trout, of course, move on down through here, and obviously because we have these two, we have to then allow them to invade. Uh, I, I should have mentioned that, but I, I guess I shouldn't have my other slide there. But anyway, and then the Bonneville cutthroat actually come from the Yellowstone cutthroat about 30,000 years ago. So they're a relatively recent form. So what happens here, the Colorado comes down here, invades, and then about 30,000 years ago, we have fish invading here. Now, the, where these fish came from uh, is a fairly well-known stream capture event. So if you look at the Bear River, if you, if I showed you the Bear River, it had a little loop on it. It goes up to Soda Springs, Idaho, and then comes back down into the Snake River system. Well, the Bear River used to flow up uh, uh, through past Soda Springs over to um, uh, the Portneuf River and then follow the Portneuf River down into the Snake System. Somewhere between 50 to 30,000 years ago, a bunch of lava flows occurred in the Soda Springs area that blocked off that blocked off the uh, Bear River. It formed a lake here. The lake was called Lake Thatcher. So if you've gone up in that area around Preston, you may have seen Thatcher, Idaho, or the Thatcher siding on the tracks. And that lake filled up, but there was so much lava that had blocked off the path of the river that when that lake overflowed, it overflowed down Oneida, the Oneida Narrows, the Oneida Canyon, and captured that stream down into the Bonneville Basin. So the Bear River was dumped down then from going here, it was transferred down into here, 
30,000 years ago, that's probably one of the reasons Lake Bonneville got so big and overflowed, causing the Bonneville flood and so forth, uh, because it brought in additional water coming off the Uinta system into this basin. And so with that, the cutthroat would have been transferred down into this basin, and then they dispersed down in here. And this is sort of where I got involved in this and looking at some cutthroat years ago using alizymes, and, and we could not separate um, the fish from this area, from Yellowstone cutthroat with alizymes, but the fish here we could not separate from Colorado River cutthroat, but we could separate them from the Yellowstone. And uh, when I talked to Benty about it, he got really upset. When he published the paper, he got more upset. And so uh, this became kind of a, a stimulus for me to keep looking at trout. <laughs> so, well, if you don't like it, I'm going to keep I think I'm right. We're going to find out who's right about this thing. Um, Anyway, <clears throat> so this is another way that he's put out his hypothesis. He's got a book that came out in 2002. It's a real nice overview of cutthroat trout, if any of you are really interested in trout. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty nice thing. But this is his, again, his scenario. And I'm just going to show you sort of his breakup again. So here's our ancestral trout. Here's the, here's the coastal. Here's the west slope branching off next, and then this line, which ultimately goes to Yellowstone, branches off. This is all the Lahontan complex. I'm not going to talk much about those uh, <clears throat> today at all. And then here's the Lahontan splitting off, and then the splitting off of the Colorado from, from the Yellowstone, and then here is the Bonneville cutthroat trout splitting off from the, from the Yellowstone line. And again, there are the dates. So I'm just going to kind of keep that. We'll, we'll come back and refer to this sort of as his hypothesis as we go through this. <coughs> um, so the question <coughs> becomes one of, when Becky did this work, and we don't want to, to belittle what Becky did because it was a massive change in the way we were conserving resources to move from saying, well, if you have one cutthroat, you've got them all. Therefore, all we've got to do is preserve Yellowstone Lake, which we now know is not the case anymore with, with the introduction of uh, whirling disease and lake trout up there. Uh, but that, that lake seemed to be one that would be preserved. We can get any cutthroat we need from anywhere out of that one place. Well, that's, it turns out there's quite a bit of diversity, and we ought to start trying to preserve that diversity. So Benji was really important in getting that going. But if the hypotheses that he had generated were correct, then we ought to be able to use other techniques to, to go back, to look at that, and they should uh, agree with the relationships that he's uh, promoted. So that was sort of what we were thinking about as we were doing the work. Um, I'm going to just talk about mitochondrial data uh, right now. We're, we're working with some nuclear data. We've done some SNP work, SNP development, and right now we're doing a lot of transcriptome work developing nuclear markers. We have roughly 100, maybe 200 genes that we can amplify for nuclear genes right now, but um, I don't have a postdoc right now, so we're just kind of looking at it and thinking it'd be nice to, to get this transcriptome data going. So I'm going to focus on the mitochondrial data. Uh, there's not been a lot published with mitochondrial DNA uh, on these things. <coughs> Wilson and Turner, working on uh, virginalis, this is the uh, real grand cutthroat, published this this uh, tree right here, maximum likelihood tree, with ND4, the mitochondrial genome, uh, almost 800 base pairs of data, uh, sequence data. <coughs> and they came up with this relationship. Here's basal down here is, is uh, the coastal cutthroat. Here's the west slope. Here's the Lahontan. They're breaking off into a little group here. Uh, and then over in here in this group, we have all of the interiors. This is the Yellowstone right here. Utah is a Bonneville. Uh, this is a uh, Colorado River cutthroat. This is a greenback. And then these are all the rear brands that I mentioned. Now, <clears throat> this sort of gives you an idea of some relationships. We see a polytony that he shows right here. That is, he was unable to resolve these relationships, uh, separating these guys out relative to those. They all come out kind of as a group. But also, if you can look at the bootstrap values on here. And the bootstrap values kind of tell you uh, how much you can rely on those branches. So when we look at this, 83 is not too bad. 83% um, of the time, these guys come out all together. 
course, they're all the same subspecies, so it makes sense they ought to. 72% of the time, this group comes out uh, with, with stomias right there, but that means that you still have, when you're running this thing, 28% uh, of the time, these guys are sticking somewhere else in this phylogeny. And 50% of the time, or 52% of the time, you break this out. And so what this tells us is us, but almost half the time it works, another half the time it doesn't. So in reality, we ought to start collapsing these nodes down wherever this occurs. That means that we can't really trust that node as, being, as telling us much. And so if we collapse this down, we would have a good line here that says, well, 74, that's not too bad of a line, that says we have Henshaw and Lewis, or the uh, Lahontan and the West Slope together. And then all of these will come down here as a polytomy. And this drops down, this group would break off with a 72% of the time, and this group right here would um, separate out. So the resolution is such that we can't really test what Banky said. Yeah. Are these all done with museum specimens that have been pickled for 100 or 300 years before the no. stocking? Or how do you these, know that stocking is not screwing up the... Oh. Sorry, I guess it's a big question. <laughs> That, that stuff is going on an awful lot. In fact, I could give you a, a full lecture just on the dynamics of Stamias right now because when we started doing our work, we, we decided, well, well, we'll take what Becky calls as a pure subspecies and we'll use those for our initial look. We then generated the phylogenies and when we found errors in there, and I'll show you a slide, I think I may have it in here still. I think I do. That you'll see some of this, we find out they don't fit within the clades. And so that would tell us something about those maybe integrates. And uh, using mitochondrial DNA, you know, we, we can kind of sort things because mitochondrial DNA is a single locus and we don't have to worry about recombination. And so that kind of gets us a little bit away from it. But in reality, there's a lot of problems associated with all the stocking. And these things also very readily will integrate or hybridize with rainbow. And so you have rainbow genes that get in there, you have Yellowstone genes, and it, what it looks like right now, I was on a panel, uh, fish and wildlife panel, looking at Stamias, the greenback. Uh, what Benke described as the classical greenback, now looks like it was stocked Colorado River cutthroat over in the, in the Arkansas and uh, South Platte drainage. And so the recovery program has spent millions trying to recover the wrong fish. And there are a couple papers that have come out, and a couple labs got cut off of funding, and they're still they're still working on the final statement. We had a panel meeting on this last summer, and so there are lots of problems with this. And but as we get more and more data, this, the pictures begin to emerge, so we're starting to see what we think should be there. And the idea that I have, of what I want to do, is we now can go through pretty well with mitochondrial DNA and begin to separate things out. But we need to be able to do that nuclear gene to find out how much gene flow has been going on, you know, what kind of pattern are going to show up with the nuclear genes with phylo uh, phylogenetic probe. Are there museum specimens? That you there are museum remember? specimens, and I have a slide, three or four slides from here, that will show something about that. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this didn't, uh, this paper didn't really change Benke's mind much because it doesn't really get the resolution to sort of approach those questions that he had. Uh, in 2012, Waxman and Keeley came out with a paper. Um, they're up at Idaho State University. And uh, they went out and uh, collected cutthroat all over the place. We didn't even know they were doing this work. They amplified ND2, the ND2 gene uh, in the mitochondrial genome, a thousand base pairs and they generated these phylogenies. Now, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this one. This is a Bayesian. This is a maximum likelihood phylogeny here. And so I just wanna kinda of quickly go over this one. When you look at this, you see some very high bootstrap values for some of these. And these are, again, going out to the various uh, subspecies, and they're separating them very nicely. Now, you notice here they've got a Bonneville Yellowstone. And if you remember when I talked about this, I mentioned that the that the Bonneville was really quite distant from the Yellowstone. And they classified it together. But they've also got down here what's called a Great Basin cutthroat. And 
what happened here is uh, they jumped into here to do this cutthroat study, but they didn't really read the books and the literature on the biology of cutthroat and, and the distribution of these things. So uh, the Great Basin, what they have here, they call Great Basin. They, they're, they put this up as a new name for the cutthroat trout. This is the Bonneville cutthroat trout that we've always studied uh, in the main Bonneville Basin. This Bonneville is actually the fish in the Bear River system that are only 30,000 years separated from the from the Yellowstone cutthroat. So, so I wasn't real happy in seeing that they hadn't gone back and done a literature search on this, but they do have some nice information here. But again, if you notice down in here, we have those weak bootstrap supports again, and all this collapses down, and so we have no resolution. You know, all we can say is, yeah, this, the subspecies are very distinct, but we don't know who came from whom because none of these, threat, these values in here are high enough for us to really feel like we're confident with that. Uh, Metcalf and uh, some others at uh, the University of Colorado went out and did another study. Now notice this is 430 base pairs using CO1 and ND2. What they did is they said, well, we don't know what a greenback really is. This is part of that greenback study. And so they went out and they got an extinct fish, McDonald eye, and actually they got that from us. We had a tissue sample that we'd taken of that one. They also got fish out of the San Juan Basin uh, that are now extinct. Um, and um, let's see, I'm trying to see if I can see the other one. Uh, I don't see the other one in here, but they got, they got these other populations. So these are museum specimens. These were collected in the, in the 1800s. Uh, some of them were at Harvard, some at the Smithsonian, some at the Cal Academy. And they extracted DNA, they did ancient DNA work on them, and then they just amplified the regions of these genes that had the variation that they wanted to look for. And what they were able to do is then resurrect some extinct, uh, some extinct lineages of fish <coughs> and, um, and put those into a phylogeny. But again, as you, you can see here, that there's no resolution, but with that many base pairs, you wouldn't expect much resolution. But it does show that something's going on there. And last summer I was talking to uh, Jessica Metcalf, who did this, who was lead author on this. <coughs> and I told her, you know, what we need to do is take, take the data, or the DNA that you've got, and barcode it and throw it onto a next gen sequencer, reassemble that, and we could probably get all kinds of information about these lineages. And the retort that her advisor had, or ex advisor had, was give me the money. Well, I don't have any. <laughs> so, okay, so we will go and do the extraction ourselves and, and do that. It can, it can be done pretty simply now with next gen sequence. Okay, so in our study, we decided we'd try to get a few more base pairs. So we went in uh, looking at these, these regions, the mitochondrial genome, uh, 3,600 base pairs of sequence, and we ended up with this phylogeny. Now, we have some better bootstrap values in here. These base ones. Uh, for the lines are pretty good. But we also have some polytomies in here, and we weren't really very happy with those polytomies. And so these things right in here tell us that we have to collapse down. That doesn't give us that resolution we'd like to see again for those fish. And so we went on, we added uh, some more genes, we ended up with 8,000 base pairs of data. And this is the phylogeny that we have uh, now. We still have, you see a, a point there and a point there that are not, not good. So we'll have some polytomies there and there, but everything else seems to resolve pretty well. And um, you can see the different lineages in here. Oh, and I skipped the part where I, I actually had some haplotypes in here that were um, from uh, uh, Yellowstone haplotypes that showed up over in the uh, Colorado River Basin from stocking that we actually picked up. In, the, in analysis. I think we took those out for this particular run. <clears throat> All right. So part of what we found then is that the cutthroat subspecies are very well supported. What Benke did in separating them out was very accurate. Um, the Bear River form of the Bonneville cutthroat is sister to the Yellowstone cutthroat. Uh, this is an argument that got me into this whole thing, and it's very clear that that's the case. I think it should be elevated to uh, subspecies status 
Uh, Benke always opposed that, um, but I think that's something that probably needs to be done just to help uh, clarify management of this, this, this group of fish. Um, the uh, Bonneville, Colorado River, Greenback, and Rio Grande cutthroat are our sister taxa with very strong separation. And uh, there are two places where you have the polytomies that may show evidence of very rapid radiation. So this is Benke's hypothesis again. If we do the same thing with what we have with our phylogeny and try to redraw this, uh, this is what, oops, there's a polytomy. This is what we get. And notice that here we have a polytomy at this point. We have this other polytomy right in here. And the Bonneville cutthroat trout, instead of coming from up here, uh, is now coming off of this line, instead of coming from down here. And so there are some very strong differences in here. And so again, comparing to that to Benke's, so there's, there's ours, there's Benke's. So there are some differences that are showing up. And uh, the question now is, Benke had divergence time. Can we get divergence time on these? And so if we can time these nodes, then we can go back and look at geological events and maybe get some insight into what may be going on uh, whether or not uh, uh, there are things that happen that might be important. Uh, so we, <coughs> Radomek, oh, this shifted over. Well, it's okay. We, uh, uh, random molecular clock. Now, this particular uh, projection was based upon a fixed clock. Uh, we're going to be rerunning this with Beast uh, and, and calibrate it using uh, fossils uh, for, the, for the analysis. But what I just wanted to show you here. These numbers right here, this number should be over here by this. Uh, there's another study done on, on trout in general, and they did a, a molecular clock. This branch right here, they, they predicted would be at 11 million. We have it at 10.38. This one we have at 16.02. They predict, uh, projected at 16. Uh, this one should be at 27, uh, and they had 25. So even using a fixed clock right now, it comes out pretty well. Uh, with other studies that have used, used uh, beast estimates for this divergence time. What we're going to be interested in are going to be these times up in here. Um, and I have moderate uh, confidence in those, those times. But again, I think we've, we've got to do another analysis to really get this where I feel good about it. Um, but anyway, uh, here are the rainbow trout. These are all rainbow trout here, are splitting off at 10 to 11 million years ago from the cutthroat line. The cutthroat are very clearly monophyletic, a single line, and um, this is a group that we're, we're most interested in. Uh, notice there's a 3.19 right there, so this divergence from the, from the coastal out is about 3 million years old. So when we put this stuff together, we end up with this kind of a timing scale for ours. Where Becky would have put this at 2 million, we're saying it's about 3. Uh, by 2.2, we have the splitting here of the West Slope and Lahontan. Uh, by about 2 million years ago, we see the Yellowstone split off from all of these other cutthroat in here. And then the Bear River split. It's kind of interesting. In about half a million years ago, even though the capture took place 30,000 years ago. But what happens when you get organisms in these drainages, and they don't tend to move a lot, then within that drainage, you're going to expect that they're going to be sitting there undergoing their own little evolutionary trajectory, even though the drainages are connected. So prior to that, that severing of the drainage connection, they'd already differentiated quite a bit from the main, uh, main stem cutthroat trout. All right, so back to Benke's and ours. So you can kind of get a feel for uh, how, those, how they differ. Now, <clears throat> this time period right in here is, is one that that's kind of interesting. This one's going to be a little more difficult because this is right in the middle of the Pleistocene. So we've got glaciation going on. There's lots and lots of stream captures and, and events taking place here during glacial periods that probably facilitated the movement of these fish into different areas. But right in here, uh, we're at the end of the end of the Pliocene, early Pleistocene time period in here, and we have quite a bit of divergence that goes on. So. If we look at Benke's hypothesis, 
uh, we want to try to generate that same kind of a picture uh, with, with our data. So the basal cutthroat diverged about 3.2 million years ago. And so let's first look at what we have for fossil evidence. <coughs> at two to three million years ago, there were fossils taken out in this part of Nevada uh, of Oncrantus clarki. And in fact, they've been said to be almost identical to the Hunt cutthroat trout out of Pyramid Lake. So they're very, they're very similar. But also, there are fossils of what is called Raptiferio. You see these right in here. This is just trout. Um, but Raptiferio here and here, Raptiferio here. Here's an Oncorhynchus. This is actually a Pacific salmon fossil that they found up in the Columbia Basin uh, that's about 5 million years old. But the Raptiferio is simply uh, an ancient trout or an old trout. And these are probably going to be the ancestor to the cutthroat trout. If you notice where they're located, uh, this is sitting over here uh, in, uh, in California, near the California-Nevada uh, border. So it's very close to the Lahontan Basin. This one is sitting up somewhere south of Boise, Idaho, in here. Uh, this one's off over in here. Th there were some connections between uh, the Deer Butte and this area. And I'm not confident that date's held up. I think I heard somebody change the date on that. I haven't gone back and checked. Um, <clears throat> so the fossil uh, cutthroat two to three million years are in the Lahontan Basin, but Raptiferio were found in Lake Idaho 46 million years ago. So then the question becomes, Lake Idaho. I don't know how many of you visited Lake Idaho. Um, or you probably have. A lot of you probably haven't, haven't known it. Um, so let's talk about Lake Idaho. But to talk about Lake Idaho, we need to take a little, quick little uh, geological survey. Most of you know that Yellowstone sits over a hot spot. And that's fairly well discussed now. A hot spot is an area where you have upwelling mantle material, uh, generally deep mantle material coming to the surface. Uh, and uh, those plumes of hot material tend to be relatively stationary in the uh, mantle of the earth. And so <coughs> that there's a plume of hot material sitting right here at Yellowstone. And because it's hot, it buoys up the land around it. Thus, Yellowstone has a higher elevation. So when you drive up to Yellowstone, you go up through Idaho, you drive up, you drive up the Snake River Plain, you get to St. Anthony, you drive out in through here, then you notice there's a big climb right out of St. Anthony, then you hit a level area where you go through and you see all the, all the uh, uh, lodgepole pine stand that they've got the experimental cuts on and stuff. And then you get up to West Yellowstone and then you climb into Yellowstone itself. And if, if, as you head up to Old Faithful, you climb up on the edge of the Yellowstone caldera. And so um, what this does, because this land's so high, because of that hot spot, the drainages tend to radiate away from it. And we can see that with the Snake River, with the Madison, the Yellowstone, uh, Green River, all these rivers are draining away from this elevated region. And that's sort of what we'd expect if you do have something like hotspot modifying the landscape. Well, this is where the Yellowstone caldera is. Uh, it last erupted, the last big eruption was about 600,000 years ago, and there's always talk about you know, the bottom of the Yellowstone Lake is, is shifting. You can see dead trees on one side of the lake where the, the land is kind of dropped on one side, it's risen on the other side, and the water shifted over around the trees and stuff. So they're still very active under there, but this is, this erupted last was a major eruption only 600,000 years ago. Well, geologists have gone back out and looked at this caldera, and they found other calderas. And so there's a whole series of calderas here. Interestingly enough, these calderas form right along the Snake River Plain. So when you drive from here to, to Yellowstone through Idaho, you're driving along the edge of a lot of these old calderas. And uh, when you hit Pocatello and you see, there's American Falls Reservoir right there, uh, and you see all the lava beds and, and that off to the west, or to the, well, to the northwest, uh, and as you drive up Idaho Falls, all of that area is really part of the, these calderas. And what that means is that at one time, Whenever these calderas were active, the drainage would have been associated with those 
instead of there where Yellowstone is, the drainages would have been farther to the, to the west. So the drainages in North America have been shifting. The continental divide has been shifting from over here over into that direction because of the activity of this hot spot. Now what's happened is basically North America is sliding in this direction. So you kind of envision there's a hot spot sitting here. North America is sliding over the top of it. As it runs over that hot spot, it blows up. And then as it passes over it, it drops back down. So think about this as if you're sitting in bed with your, with your foot sticking up under the sheet, and you pull the sheet up. The sheet will rise when it goes over your foot. It gets on the other side of your foot. It drops back down. And that's what's forming this plane. This area is elevated. And then as, a, as it moves away from the hot spot, it collapses back down. And that tends to favor the capture of, of streams into this system. And the Snake River is going to be flowing right along the edge of that that whole uh, hot spot track. Okay, now they've dated these things, and as you would expect, this is in millions of years, there's our Yellowstone, and you can go back and you can look at this, and 16 million years ago, you're sitting out over here near Battle Mountain, Nevada, in that area for, this, for the eruption. Uh, by the time we get to 10 million years ago, we're sitting over here somewhere near uh, Twin Falls, and the time frame that we're interested in, which is going to be around 4 million years or so, would put us with the hot spot sitting over in this region here. And the drainages coming off this way would be <coughs> forming the ancestral Snake River in this upper Snake River plain. Now, what happens in here <coughs> is that with these changes in drainages, we have a number of events that then become fairly important in terms of influencing the dispersal and distribution of fishes in Western North America. And so I've got five events here that have some time constraints on them. Of these five, and I don't expect you to read through all of these real quickly or anything, but of these five, for what we're talking about in the time range and location, really there are three that are important. One is the connection of the Upper Snake River through the Humboldt River in the Lawton Basin to the Pitt Sacramento River. That is, the Snake River, the Upper Snake River, did not flow into the Columbia, but it flowed off to the west through Nevada and from there into the Pitt River and down into Sacramento. So that was how it was for probably, now uh, this river formed, the Humboldt River formed about 9 million years ago, so <clears throat> the 10 million probably should be 9, so we're probably looking at about 6 million years, that's the way the Snake River flowed. And then roughly around 2.5, 3 to 2.5 million years ago, that changes. So that's one thing that's fairly important. The second one is at that 2.5 million year period, roughly, the Snake River gets captured into the Columbia River Basin. So it changes drainages completely. Instead of going to the Sacramento and heading to California, it now goes north to the Oregon-Washington border. Um, the other item that is important is going to be the Bear River capture from the Snake River into the Monaco Basin. And that's probably going to be of minor importance, so we're not going to have much time to talk about that one. So basically, we had this system flowing in this direction. But we also know there was a lake here. It's considered to be a rift lake. This is Lake Idaho. And what happens here is we have this long-lived lived lake, uh, and fish would get into here and die, fall to the bottom, and they have lots of rich fossils in here. So in Lake Idaho, they have all these fossils, and that's where that Rabbitferio was found. Now the thing is that Rabbitferio is in a drainage system at this time that is associated not with the Columbia, but it's associated with the Sacramento system. <coughs> and what that says is that the most, uh, I think the most plausible dispersal route for trout would have been to come this way, up this system here, and not this way that Menke had proposed. Because we have the fossil evidence that suggests strongly that, that they were there. Now, it's possible they came up this way, and because it's so good at crossing continental divides, they may have crossed continental divides and gotten into this basin. So there, there are all, obviously alternate hypotheses that, that probably would need to be tested. But this is the simplest one. It's a, it came down here, swam up the river, and got there. Um, Four million years ago, we're still in kind of the same scenario. <coughs> and <coughs> so 
So at this point, Lake Idaho has its main connection to the Humboldt uh, Pitt Sacramento system. And these are the other things that I already had listed. Now, um, this is just kind of trying to draw our route here. The fish would have come up here. They would have had access to the Lahontan Basin, the Upper Snake Basin, and this region in here because of Lake Idaho. So they would have been able to get all through this area in here with that, that route. Now, by three million years ago, some things are happening. Uh, and I didn't point this out, but, but this is the Salmon River. Uh, prior to this, the Salmon River actually came over here, flowed into this stream right here. This is the big hole, I think, if I remember right. And it went up this way into the Missouri. But a, this part of the Salmon River came back. It actually captured this. It beheaded this, the headwaters of this stream and changed that water to flowing down this way. That's going to form quite a bit of uh, more velocity in here and could easily begin to form incision or nick points in that system as that water is flowing through there. Uh, I, I kind of think this may be one of the key factors that, that accelerates this back cutting of this stream is that the elevation drops here and that speeds the water up which means this stream cuts back faster and this little stream right here is going to cut back and it's going to capture or cut into that northern end of Lake Idaho. So it will be a lake capture event and because that Lake Idaho is going to start draining and it will drain down through here that's going to cut Hell's Canyon in the Snake River with that draining of that lake. So, and I'm not going to show you that, that's too much reading. <clears throat> so when that happens, Lake Idaho begins to drain. As it drains, remember it used to flow this way. Now the water's flowing out this way. That's lowering the lake, which is causing these areas in here to now have a nick point. And that's going to start cutting back here. And that is going to reverse the flow of the water from the lake, which used to go this way. Now this stream is going to reverse directions and go this way, and the Snake River now becomes part of the Columbia River Basin. That means that the water that was going into this system, driving this, is now drying up. Once that water dries up, it's going to start to fragment that area. And so what we would see is now with that transfer that the fish that are in here are now isolated, the fish that were down here are isolated, they still have the coastal connections, but uh, they don't have a, this interior connection, and as that nick point moves up, the fish that are up in here now are going to be above some fairly rapid, rapid water movement on the Snake River. Not necessarily waterfalls like we see at Shoshone Falls. That was formed during the uh, Bonneville flood. But probably some fairly steep areas in here which would be very difficult for fish to navigate. Uh, the fish that were in this region would move downstream. Those would become the West Slope cutthroat. And so we've got those going there. Then we have a capture event or, or a, a stream capture that at least that will allow the fish to get into the Colorado Basin. And I'm going to just hurry through this because we're getting short on time. And from the Colorado Basin, we have some diversification. We have some getting into the Bonneville Basin to form the Bonneville Cutthroat Trout. And then we have fish moving from here to form the Greenback and the Rio Grande uh, Cutthroat. And uh, there, there's another invasion that probably took place about a million years ago between the Arkansas and the uh, South Platte. And then right at the very end, we have here the Bear River fish moving into the Bonneville Basin. And I think that's it. So, no. <laughs> Subspecies and hybrids, are they ecologically doing similar niches or do they have some you know, ecological? Um, <coughs> they have some differences. Um, so the, the Lahontan cutthroat trout um, are able to handle really warm temperatures. And, and uh, there's also the town of Pyramid Lake, they're, they're the largest of the cutthroat. I think they have records up to around 40 pounds for the that lake. Um, the, uh, Yellowstone up in the Snake River system have a form that's called the Snake River Cutthroat Trout. It's a fine spotted uh, trout. It's only found in the, in the Snake River itself. And it has a very different behavior than the classical Yellowstone Cutthroat. When you go fish for it, it handles swift water. It's a, it's a much stronger swimmer. 
And uh, I'm not convinced that it necessarily is a separate subspecies benthic though it was. Uh, it may be that when these fish uh, are initially, we find, we find both these, both of those forms of awning together in the same reds, and, you know, so they, they're exchanging genes all the time. But then we end up with the fine spot in the river and the large spotted ones up in the small finger streams. And I, I kind of wonder if there may not be some kind of predation driven selection on those uh, where uh, out of, there's, a, there's some work that, that's been done on spotting patterns in guppies and things, which has talked about if the guppies are in a real weedy habitat, they can have lots of color and big spots, but if they're in a very bland or very fine grain habitat, if they have big spots on them, they eat real fast. And so it selects for these different uh, morphs. And I kind of wonder if that's not the case. I've talked to some people up at Montana State about the need to go out and tether a bunch of these fish and different spotting patterns out in, in the river and look at mortality, but I don't think the Animal Use Committee would let me do that. <laughs> Maybe that would be a way to kind of approach that type of thing. But yeah, they do have, they do have very different uh, areas that they, they do well in. Are the coastal a pretty uniform population? Is there a lot of migration up and down the coast? Or they stay? I don't know how much migration. I haven't worked enough with enough populations of coastals to really answer that. Um, I know that some studies that have been done have been able to, to break them apart in the Oregon, Washington area. So my guess is that there's somewhat limited gene flow that's going on within those populations. Now, these coastals are anadromous. So they, they go out and they live in the ocean, swim up into the, into the streams to spawn. But when they go down to the ocean, they, they pretty well stay in the estuaries. They don't go out to sea. They, they stay within probably a, uh, a few miles of the, the mouth of the stream that they're from. So my guess is they don't move too much. So any, any dispersion of genes is probably relatively small. But I have not looked at those like I have the interior cut from, so I can't answer that. Um, as you expanded your sequence database to try and improve resolution of those weekly supported nodes, did you find your topologies changed much at all? Um, <coughs> not too much. Um, they changed a lot from, I had actually had an old RFLP data set that I was going to show, and they changed tremendously from that. The RFLP data I sent them lots a long time ago. Um, so they changed a little bit, but once we get up to, up to Several thousand base pairs. They, they start to stabilize, but they but the but the um, uh, bootstrap values are still not real good until we get higher. Now we could go back through and do this with the entire mitochondrial genome, and we thought about it. If we do that, we'll probably do it with next gen sequencing and just amplify everything up, label it, throw it in, and then sort it out with uh, bioinformatics techniques at the other end. But uh, we haven't quite decided if it's worth doing that because we really need to move the nuclear markers to get a better picture of everything that's going on. Yeah. Are there karyotypic differences between rainbow and cut code? Or? Um, yeah, in fact, I didn't throw any, any benches work on the karyotypes, but there are. Um, so they, they do change, and it's just a matter of some of the arms breaking, you know, having them separate. Um, I can't remember exactly how that goes. There are karyotypic differences even within the test row. I think initially when I started the work, we were going to do karyotypes on it. And since I didn't do karyotypes, uh, I sent my graduate student off to a lab down in Texas. And they said, what are you guys wasting your time with on karyotypes? You should be doing DNA. So, uh, so my student came back all depressed and wanted to do DNA work and that started off in another direction. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr.